Hey everyone, before I get into the stories, I just want to let you all know that they're very intense. Story number one actually mentions murder, and story number two mentions sexual abuse of a child. Story number two is actually the first story in a long time that actually really upset me. It was really hard to get through. I'll have the stories labeled in a timestamp just in case you do want to skip them. All that being said, if you ever want to share your story, you can send it at southerncannibal.com. Now if you're all ready, let's get started on the stories. And remember, to always, stay hungry. I'm a 31-year-old male, and I live about 50 or so miles north of New York City in a region known as the Mid-Hudson Valley. The story takes place when I was around 19 to 20 years old in a small city known as Newburgh. For those who don't know, Newburgh has a notoriously high crime rate for its small size. It consistently ranked as the murder capital of New York, and it's one of the most dangerous cities in the U.S. This will be very relevant throughout the entire story. In addition, it's also home to a relatively well-known college known as Mount St. Mary College. My two friends and I, who will refer to as Mark and Brian, were going to a party somewhere in town that we had found out about through some friends at the college. On our way, we had saw a few cop cars zoom past us with their sirens on. This will also be important later. Brian decided to stop and get some gas on the main road downtown. As we're pulling in, I had spotted a group of sketchy guys across the street adjacent to the gas station start to cross and then approach our car. I tried to tell Brian, Bro, don't stop here. Those dudes are about to pull up on us. Drive away, man. The dumbass disregards me and then just says, Bro, it's all good, man. As he then gets out to pump gas. Of course, as this is happening, they approach us aggressively and one of them pretends to be whimpering in pain. Yo, my boy got shot. We need a ride to St. Luke's right now. St. Luke's is the hospital in the city. When Brian hesitates and then says, I can't dude, I'm staying out of this. The group of thugs start banging on the car and shaking it violently, then screaming. Open the fucking door or I'm gonna kill all of you. Along with all kinds of other crazy ass threats. They then notice a taxi drive by and try to carjack the taxi driver. I tried to use this opportunity to escape and go inside the store. To my horror and anger, I couldn't unlock the door to get out. The fucking dumbass has the child's safety lock on. They then return to our car after failing to jack the taxi cab. Mark is now screaming, Call the fucking cops! They start beating on the car yet again and trying to shake it. One of them screams at Mark. If you don't get out of the car now, I'm going to kill you and your fucking friend. Okay, dude, chill. I'm getting out. Mark says. Don't tell me to fucking chill. He then leaves the car and goes inside the store. The thugs then cram themselves in the car with me at the very back. One of them had said something to me very calmly that I don't remember now. Then out of nowhere, they start jumping me. I don't really remember what happened next, but I managed to find my way to the front passenger seat and I made it out of the car. As I was leaving, the largest one actually kicks me in the face, knocking off my glasses. I then run into the store where my friend's trying to call the cops. As this is happening, Another random rough looking dude starts trying to take the phone from him. In the middle of all this, this random lady then starts saying, What's the matter? You scared? You're in Newburgh. Don't you know you have to be tough out here? Go cry home to your mommy, you little pussies. Then she says, They're gone now. You can go outside. Right as she says this, the police pull up. Mark and Brian told them everything that happened. As this is happening, Brian notices a huge crack on the windshield. One of these scumbags smashed the windshield. Brian then went. They were arrested up the road. Brian went along in an unmarked car just to confirm their identity and press charges, 
since he then needed to file an insurance claim. After we were done with the police and headed home, we smoked a fat-ass blunt to try and calm down after what had just happened. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept hearing nangs around the house that weren't there, and I was jumping around the entire night. I remained hypervigilant for a while after this incident. I even remember one day hearing a party across the street, believing I was hearing screams of terror, like people were getting slaughtered only to find out it was just a bunch of kids running around having fun. It's really crazy how it affected me. As for the sirens we saw beforehand, we later learned a shooting that had just taken place further up the road at a party close to where we were heading at. As a result, it had set off a chain reaction of several violent incidents throughout the city that night and the days following. One thing I found out that happened a few days later really had me shook. Apparently, just a couple of days after that same incident we were involved in, someone got jumped while pumping gas at the same gas station. The perpetrators beat the shit out of him, and then ran him over with his own car before they took off. The man later died from his injuries. I'm very lucky to be alive after that incident. I really hope that I never have to deal with something like that again. Please, everyone. Be aware of your surroundings. I'm a female in the UK. I'm in my 30s now, but when I was younger, I'd worked at a gas station situated very close to a motorway. I did night shift along with two other people, and we had quiet periods during the night. Behind the said gas station, there were some thick trees and if you ran through them, you would have ended up in a really wooded area. This incident took place on a Thursday. We were in a quieter period, so me and my colleague were doing some cleaning while my other colleague had his break around the back. Our entrance doors were automatic, and right in front of them was the sandwich aisle, then the juice section. I was at the sandwich area checking dates when I had heard the doors then open and loud footsteps. Before I could turn around, I felt someone grab onto me as if they were trying to hug me. It took me a second to comprehend what was happening because I was so confused and it happened so quickly. I looked at the side and I realized a young boy was holding on to me and he felt freezing. It was very late January, so it was horrendous outside for weather. I sensed something was wrong, so I didn't freak out. My other colleague couldn't see any of this because she was down a different aisle, so it was just me. I remember not pulling away, but I had kept my arms lifted upwards, sort of stiff, and I asked him what was going on. He lifted his face while still holding on to me, and it was then that I noticed he had a busted lip and a black eye, as well as tears that were streaming down his face. He looked absolutely terrified and it was then that I realized he was shaking. I asked him what was wrong, but he just started sobbing loudly. I pulled him into a hug, and I told him it was okay. He was safe now, and we would get him help. I then shouted at my colleague, who I'll call Claire. She came dashing to where I was, and I then told her we needed to call the police. She had her mobile in her pocket, so she was able to call right then and there. The operator asked to speak to me, but the boy I was holding grabbed my arm when I tried to take the phone. Claire ended up holding it to my ear, and I tried my best to answer the operator's questions. I told him the boy had just ran into our store, and he had facial injuries, and he was clearly very petrified and crying. I explained that he was holding on to me, and the operator told me to just try and keep him calm. He asked if he could speak to the boy, but I couldn't get him to speak as he was crying so much and he was burying his face into me. He was small and young looking. I figured that he must have been like 13 at most. He also appeared Asian and I wasn't even sure at this point if he knew English or if he was even British. Claire ended up going off the phone and the officers arrived rather quickly. The boy was still holding on to me, but he did look up when the police arrived. I'd just been telling him everything would be okay, and I was honestly holding back tears myself. 
It just broke my heart to listen to this kid crying his heart out. I knew something dark must have happened, but even I wasn't expecting it to be as dark as it ended up being. When the officers arrived, they were male. The boy saw them and started freaking out. He turned to me, and he begged for me to keep the men away from him. He just kept repeating, No, 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 and saying that he didn't want the men to touch him anymore. This was really hard for me to hear, because I had a horrible feeling as to why he would say something like that. The police didn't get too close, but one of the officers did speak to the boy. He gently told him that they wouldn't touch him or hurt him, and he asked if he would feel more comfortable with a female officer. He nodded to this, and then started crying again. I kept trying to comfort him while also talking to one of the officers, whilst the other spoke to Claire. Our colleague who had been on his break was now aware of what was going on, and he made his presence known. But we agreed that it would probably be better if he stayed at the hills while we dealt with this. I asked the boy his name, and he did tell me, but I'll call him Jack for privacy. I told Jack that we needed to move into a private area of the store, and I assured him he would be safe now. I walked with my arm around him to the staff-only area around the back, and we went into the office area. We kept the office door open, and the police stood at the door while me and Jack sat down. Jack sat with his head in his hands, and his legs were trembling violently. I asked him if he would like some water, but then the police officer interrupted, and he said he was sorry, but that I couldn't give him any water. I was annoyed at the time, but looking back, I get it. It could have erased evidence or something. Female officers arrived, and the male officers went to speak to my other colleagues. Jack refused to talk unless I was there, so I had to stay with him, which I honestly didn't mind. He was still very cautious with the officers, but had seemed more relaxed with the female officers. He said his name, and that he didn't know where he was. His English was pretty good, but I could tell that it wasn't his first language, and he had an accent. He said that he was from Vietnam, and he had been in another country before ending up here. He said that he escaped from a van, and that he didn't know how long he ran for, but that he just ran through a wooded area and down to our gas station. I don't know exactly where that wooded area leads, but it has mountainous sections, and there's a road really far up, so they must have had him there. He told us he was 12, and that he had escaped from the back of his captor's van. He told us that he had been forced to be with other men, but he clammed up when he said that. The police then said that they needed to take him to the hospital to be examined, as well as to the police station to talk to him some more. He was really upset at the idea of leaving me. I told him that he had to go with the officers, and that they would keep him safe. It was surreal, and very emotional. I remember giving him a hug, and telling him that he could face what lay ahead, and that he was so brave for escaping his captors. I was supposed to be working the night shift on the Saturday, but my boss had told me to take some time off after what happened. The incident reached the news, although the police had switched around some of the details, which I assume was for privacy. The news said that they were searching for human traffickers after the boy had been found by a member of the public, which was obviously me. It turned out that he had been trafficked from Vietnam to another European country before coming to the UK. His captors were actually planning to take him somewhere else, but I have no idea how the police or news knew that. He had been physically as well as sexually abused. I assumed that his captors at least beat him up, but I don't know if they were selling him for sexual abuse or if they did that to him too. It makes me feel sick. The news had also mentioned that he was in the care of social services and that he was receiving lots of support. They also mentioned asylum seekers were involved, which leads me to believe that his home life wasn't safe, or maybe he didn't have any family. I've tried to Google the story since this all happened, but I've never been able to find out if his captors were caught or any of the other men, or if he was sold to others. It makes me so angry that these sick fucks exist, and it was a cold reality check for me. I might sound naive, 
but I had no idea sex traffickers were anywhere near the area I lived in at the time. It wasn't a well-known city or tourist attraction, but I guess that's why the traffickers brought him through the area. I'll never forget that little boy, and I'll never forget the fear and pain that he had in his eyes. The way he clutched onto me and cried into me still makes me incredibly emotional to think about. I was the first person he encountered in God knows how long who wasn't out to get him. I can't imagine what he endured. I don't even know how long he was being held for. It could have been years for all I know. He was 12 years old and already had all that to carry on his shoulders. I hope wherever he is now he's found some peace. I don't know how he would, but I hope he somehow found it. I know it sounds weird, but I'm glad I was looking at the sandwich dates that night. If my male colleague had been doing it instead of me, I really worry that Jack wouldn't have came in and he would have been found by his captors. I felt like he felt safe seeing a woman because none of his tormentors were female, at least from my understanding. It's been years now and I don't live in that area anymore and I'm not in that line of work. I continued working there for another year after this incident and I never saw or heard from Jack again. I want to thank Southern Cannibal for allowing people to share these stories. They're dark, but it really brings awareness to the darkness in our world. I hope everyone listening stays safe out there. This world really is a dark place. This took place in the mid-90s when I was in my early 20s working a night shift at a gas station. I'm a female. I would occasionally work the day shifts, but this was very rare. We had a new girl starred who I'll refer to as Rose. Rose was around my age, covered in piercings literally from head to toe, which will become relevant later, and she was very loud and brash. She had started on the day shifts, but our manager told us that she'd be moved to nights with me eventually. We had three night shift workers, so we did feel understaffed and I was glad we had someone new. However, I didn't immediately warm up to Rose. I can't really explain why, but she just gave me a bad vibe, and I believe you should always trust that feeling inside you when it rears its head, no matter how ridiculous it may appear to the outside world. Anyway, I met her for the first time on a night shift. That night, three of us were working, so that me and my other colleague could train Rose some more. The first month of her working there was fine, but like I said, I simply didn't take to her. I didn't let her know this, obviously, and I behaved as if I liked her. On our first shift alone together, I was really dreading it a little, because Rose got on my nerves so much. She was one of those people who was brash and annoying, and was always trying to show off with a voice like a foghorn. She constantly made sexual jokes, and it got old very fast. I'm sorry to stereotype, but she had the sense of humor of a 12-year-old boy. She told me how she had nipple and genital piercings, and how she wanted to become a nudist, but claimed that her boobs were way too large to not wear a bra. I didn't know how to respond to any of this, because I just found it really cringy. She barely knew me and I obviously didn't want to know these intimate details. On our first night together, it had gotten to the slower hours, as once the taxi driver crew left at about 3 a.m., it could be very quiet until about 5 or 6 a.m. It was during this time after all those drivers had gone when Rosen told me that she was popping to the toilet. I said okay, and I told her to take her break if she wanted. She said thanks, and then disappeared. Now, we didn't have staff toilets, so we had to use the ones open to the public. They were close to the counter, though, so I would have heard and seen Rose exit the toilets when she was done. However, a really long time passed without her coming back out, like 20 minutes had passed. I thought this was strange, but I didn't want to seem like a weirdo by going and asking if she was okay, but after 30 minutes had passed... I decided that I had to, just in case that she had somehow hurt herself. I knocked on the door and asked if everything was alright, 
And Rose replied back a little breathlessly, It's all good. I wondered why she sounded so breathless, but I figured that maybe she had an accident and was just embarrassed or something. I hesitated, and then I told her if she needed anything to just give me a shout, but she didn't even reply. I walked back to the till and sat down, and I looked up at the CCTV. No one was outside, and the road looked quiet. I decided to stock some shelves, and I don't know how long I'd been doing it when Rose finally came out. She looked sweaty, but I didn't say anything. I just nodded when I saw her standing by the till. She looked red and kept looking at me, which I found weird. When I was done stocking the shelves, I tried talking to her, but she seemed distant. I asked her if she took her break, and she told me yes, then grinned at me very creepily. I told her that I was going to take a breather myself, and then she just smiled at me. That shift had ended, and every shift afterwards she would go into the bathroom for long periods of time, and then leave, all sweaty and red in the face. I was convinced that she was doing drugs or something, but whenever I went to clean, I could never find anything suspicious. I told one of the other night shifts girls about it, and all they told me was she did the same thing with them. We didn't know what she was up to, but it was really annoying to be doing all the work while she was in there doing whatever she was up to. I was determined to uncover what exactly she was up to, though. So one night when she exited the bathroom, I decided to ask her. She stared at me, then smiled, before then telling me she was in there playing with her genital piercing. I guess she was using a euphemism, but she really said it like that. I actually burst out laughing at the absurdity of it, and I asked, But doesn't that hurt? It sounded so crazy and unexpected, but Rose wasn't laughing. She just kept smiling at me, before then saying, That's how I like it. That wiped the laughter lines right off my face. I felt shivers ripple through me and I didn't know what to say, so I told her that since she was out now, I'd go for my break. I really couldn't wait to go home, and I just wanted the shift to be over already. After that night, Rose got more brazen about her activities. She started telling me, I'm away to touch my piercing, then she'd wink at me and go into the bathroom. This made me extremely uncomfortable, and when I told one of the other night shift girls, she joked that Rose probably wanted me to follow her into the toilets. I told her that wasn't funny, and that we wouldn't be joking about it if a man was jerking in the bathroom and telling us about it. My colleague agreed, but said we couldn't report her to the manager because Rose would know it was us, so that we might as well cope with humor. She hadn't told anyone else what she was doing, but they now knew better than to ask. When Rose and I were alone, she began doing other weird stuff as well. I walked into the stock room and I saw her rubbing her chest against the wall with her head flung back, and when she saw me, she grinned. I turned away and sat at the tills, way too scared to go back there. I was absolutely disgusted with her behavior, and every time I had to work with her, I could barely sleep that day because I was dreading it so much. I was too scared to tell my parents because they're the type who would show up in my workplace and grapple Rose outside. I did tell my friends outside work though, and they all agreed that Rose was a creep and really escalating her behavior. They told me I needed to do something, but I was nervous. I'm not a very confrontational person. I'm pretty reserved even now. However, things came to a head one night and I lost my cool. Me and Rose were once again on the same shift together. She did her disgusting bathroom routine, but this time when she got out, she wouldn't stop going on about how she'd been touching herself. I don't know why, but I just lost it. I ended up telling her to shut the fuck up and that she was being disgusting for telling me about it. I told her that customers have been known to do wild shit in that bathroom, literally shitting on the floor and smearing it on the walls. Yet she's in there jerking it with all that gross bacteria. I then told her if she didn't stop being a pervert, I'd tell our manager and I'd walk out of the store right now and that I didn't care or want to be involved in her weird fetish bullshit. 
She just stared at me before pulling the chair out behind the till and throwing her body down. I continued stacking shelves, and neither of us spoke at all for the rest of the shift. The next time I was on the shift with her, I had arrived for 11 p.m. Rose wasn't there, and one of the girls who had been on the evening shift had to wait with me, as we couldn't be alone on night shift. We tried calling Rose's house phone and mobile, but she didn't answer. It just rang and rang. We ended up calling one of the other night shift girls, and she came in, letting the other girl go home who had to wait with me. We had told our manager that morning, and he was furious and tried to contact Rose, but she never picked up, and she never came back. I guess she quit her job due to my outburst, and to be honest, I'm glad she did. It's been years since this happened, but I will always remember it. It might not be scary to some, but it was horrifying for me. Rose was a certified creep who, looking back, was clearly trying to act out some fetish or something. I've never seen her since, and I hope I never do. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night, everyone. And remember... To always stay.